Film Club. Thank you very much for joining us for another episode of Film Club. I am one of your hosts, Andy Harrison. With me, as always, it's Andy Donaldson. Hi, Andy, every week in Film Club, we invite our lovely viewers along to watch a film with us. This week, we've invited them to watch Guy and Madeline on a park bench. This is Damien Chazelle's directorial debut. He actually uh, did this when he was at Harvard. And it's a film about a relationship to people, Guy and Madeline. It's about a, a guy who's a jazz uh, trumpet trumpeter, uh, Madeline, who's kind of like looking, looking, find a life. She 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 doesn't really know where she wants to go. She she's just finding something anyway, and they have a good relationship. But it's kind of coming to the edge, and you find someone else. And it turns out that this is basically a prototype for La La Land. Exactly, like, it plays it's, it's, out yeah. in a very similar fashion. The way in which the film is made is totally different. Mm. Like it's a very different fashion of filmmaking. But like the narrative and the ideas and the themes are still totally La La Land, which was interesting. We talked last week about how when he was doing Whiplash, he made a yeah, short yeah. film before doing the feature of Whiplash. I never realized there was kind of a similar sort of thing going on here with La La Land. It's it's raw and it's rough. Um, it, to me, it feels at times, not all the time, it feels a bit like a student film. Mm. That's not necessarily a bad thing. No, There are some things I don't like about it. The dialogue, at some cases, could be used with an ADR. It's some of the dialogue's mm. a bit rough. Mm-hmm. The reason that they don't use ADR is they actually uh, don't use professional actors. They actually mm-hmm. use, like, a, the, for example, Guy is actually a, a trumpeter in real life. Uh, the shots can sometimes be a bit rough. The editing can be a bit rough. When the transition scenes without the music, the, the sudden switch kind of throws me off a bit. Mm-hmm. I can get past those uh, small things. The good things about this film, let's go straight into it, is amazing. The, the, how, like, my favorite, probably one of my favorite moments of this film, this too, is where they're in the, the first tap dancing scene. <laughs> and the singing and the camera's going around yeah. and it's a live performance. And then I, what I love about it is you have like kind of whiplash. He, he later does it in whiplash where he, he's got the handheld camera and he switches between people like that. He switches between guy and then um, the tap dancing yeah. and back and forth using yeah. the door frame. It's like a, the, to block him out. But at the he same lo- time, he together. loves that shot. Mm, he's in, it in all three of his films now, isn't he? Ah, I need to, I need to revisit it in La Land to be fair. Yep. Yeah. And it, it's an incredible scene. Uh, it, it's also uh, one of the things, it's my other scene as well, is the tap dancing scene in the diner where she's singing as well. Uh, mm-hmm. That's incredible. Like yep. Obviously, that, that, that evolves into tap dancing. It's amazing how he's managed to capture those live instruments as well as performances, as well as the energy and the electrifying kind of nature that, that everything is around. Great. Really love that. You can appreciate what he's done and how he's evolved when it comes to Whiplash and La La Land. This is absolutely what I love from Loki Verite work because it's so... Like you said, it's raw. It feels honest, which is funny because, like, you're totally correct. Like, the fact that they're using actors that aren't professional actors and the mixing is is slightly off at times and the cinematography is slightly off at times. It's so rough and ready around the edges. And he does this strange blend of, like, embracing that. But then I feel like the musical sequences are trying to be something more. And he would later on go on to, to capture that properly. But doing it here with sixty grand, that's what the budget for this film was. It was only sixty thousand yeah. dollars, which is it's it's micro budget. Like yeah, you go you kind of in terms of structure of budget, anything sub a million is considered low budget. Anything sort of sub, I don't know, roughly a quarter of a million becomes micro budget. A lot of it comes through in a very earnest way, and it's mm. there's times where you're watching the film and you're almost you're caught up in thinking about the process in which they're making it. I think at those times, that's when the film is a little bit distracting, unfortunately. But thankfully, they are few and far between because the rest of the yeah. time, you're mm-hmm. you're kind of swept up in this weird, presented in almost a montage fashion, like time ebbs and flows, and we're allowed to experience periods with these with these characters where we don't necessarily have to have definitive beginnings and endings because it almost feels like you're just dipping into their lives for a moment. I was just thinking that, yeah, you, you've like got a snippet of their life, their relationship, their period of maybe six to six months to a year. You're coming in and out of there. There's no start, stop. Um, it's just an in between, and you're focused on that in between mm. and letting the music talk for it. I mean, look at um, what happens with I can't remember a name, a guy's second girlfriend that he, that he picks up. Mm. Her story 
ends with her like in this weird sort of relationship with an older man. Like mm. the last time we see her is Elena. when she's uh yeah, Elena is when she's gone to that guy's house and then oh, bumped the into yeah, his kid and they sit down and have a game of twenty questions and that that's when she leaves the film. Like how bizarre is that? But clearly it's mm-hmm. because like Damien Chazelle probably wanted this feeling of like you know, life doesn't end when the credits come on. People don't mm-hmm. just stop existing. So he wanted this sort of like open-ended nature, I guess. It's quite interesting when you said about, obviously he's trying to let the, the, some of the moments about the music speak for itself. He's managed to incorporate the live performances as they are, rough, ready, energetic. And yet he's got the absolute production value of the of the more musical sequences, like the, like the, the latter part of the diner scene where everything's just like on point, everything's on key. The way she sings, it's it's so well choreographed, it's so well pre-thought out, and it's not in that moment sort of live, mm. but it is in the moment. But do you know what I mean? It's it's almost like um, he, he's he's got he's looked after both sides. You know, you've got your live side, and you've got your recorded side. He's done exceptionally well there. He works with this, and Justin Herbert, and we mentioned before, he's his long-time collaborator who's, who does the composition for these films. I've actually just, whilst I was watching this film, I made sure to get the soundtrack for this and uh, Whiplash and shot it onto my uh, Spotify playlist just so I could listen because I love listening <laughs> to La La Land. Mm. You can see her with roots as well. So yeah. there's amazing, some yeah. uh, amazing moments. The score comes in and you can hear these little stabs. You can hear the themes, the instrument combinations and like these fillers. And you can see how much of an influence that later goes to be in La La Land. And the songs I want to know out to A Lovely Night, you know, because that's got even the tap dancing part that Chazelle uses again. But you've got the little kind of like this and then you've got Planetarium Planetarium mm. is full full of that uh, the song itself is full of all those kind of little moments with it that each instrument has their own little moment um, much like I said in the interview I posted on Whiplash uh, comments again it just shows the evolution of those two and how, how they progress to the level they're at mm-hmm. and you obviously listen to the music of La La Land and it's like obviously like unbelievably crisp and clean when it wants to be it's just amazing and it's really cool to see that he kind of got to the grasp of that at the start here because the music mm. for this is absolutely uh, absolutely sublime it's amazing i think i find this film more interesting than i do consider it like a a, a really great work i find that a lot of the ideas here are fantastic ideas that aren't quite yet formed but we yeah, know yeah. that like within within the next coming couple of years for their career they very quickly do form those ideas and they do get the financial backing necessary and they they do kind of like pair themselves up with some great talent that can really let them let them sing but right here they're not necessarily there yet and it's not like you said it's not a bad thing it feels like watching you know one of the best student films ever made yeah it, I, i'm so glad and not only i say this i'm so glad i got to watch his work that i didn't know and love his, his work he's known for their mm. work should i say and then come back and revisit this is like yeah. this is where it all started sometimes because people say to the opposite end it's got a lot of it's got a lot of charm in the fact that it does have those rough and ready edges. It's got a lot of charm in the fact that, you know, it's shot in black and white on 16 mil. And it's got a lot of charm to the fact that yeah, while, while, while they're doing that, like when they're recording dialogue on set and you can hear the camera sort of like in the, in the background, it's got a lot of charm to the fact that when they're doing those tap dancing sequences, people aren't clear, aren't like professional dancers. And mm. even one of your protagonists is a great trumpet player, but he's not a great actor. Like a lot of that sort of characteristic and that sort of un, molded clay has a lot of personality to it i put down a little note at the end here i mentioned about how you can like we're going about the evolution of those two you can see how on a technical perspective so with regards majorly to the cinematography and the editing like we spoke about last week this is very much like a prelude to whiplash however when we're going to a musical perspective as you just mentioned towards the start this is almost like a like a short or like a a, a concept for la la land it's uh i'm, I'm really glad we did this mate yeah, it, it's really good. And I think if anybody really likes uh, Damien Chazelle, if you like La La Land, if you like Whiplash, I know we keep kind of forgetting about First Man, but if you like those two films, definitely go and watch this. Absolutely give it a crack because it's a it's a lovely personality-filled um, sort of slice of life. Yeah, very much so. But anyway, there is Guy and Madeline on a park bench. You can let us know what you thought of the film down in the comments below, or you can hit Andy and I up on Twitter. But we will be back once again next week, where we're going to take a look at insomnia. Nice. So until then, get watching. Catch you later.